Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are um, joined by Ivan Baidak, who's going to uh, uh, read from his novel, Invisible, and talk to us about it this afternoon. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we are joining you, from which we are joining you today. Um, Yvonne, Kaylee, and I are joining you from Tecoronto, which for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Wyandotte Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Sarah joins us from Waterloo, which is the land also tra traditionally cared for by the Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe, as, Anishinaabe and as well as the neutral peoples. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on their territory. We are going to be talking uh, today with Yvonne Baidak, but uh, specifically we're going to be having conversations about social justice, uh, facial differences, disability, invisibility, and, and visibility. In that, uh, in that vein, I am going to personally be matching any donations up to uh, $50 to the Help Heroes of Ukraine uh, charity uh, from which donations of the sales of Invisible are um, going towards, and About Face International, which is a, a Canadian charity that services people worldwide with uh, facial differences, and Tourette.ca, which is a Canadian organization supporting individuals with Tourette syndrome. Yvonne Bidak, welcome to Junction Reads. Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, big pleasure for me to be here. Thank you so much for cool. joining us. Um, I'm excited to hear you read. But before I share your biography and we get into your reading, I'd love to ask what you're reading right now. Yeah, what I'm reading right now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, to be, to be honest, um, the recent books I finished are from Slovenian authors. Uh, because, yeah, uh, before coming to Canada, I was in Slovenia, so I, I got to know this um, culture. So among the names are Drago Jancher and Boris Pachor, who are like uh, one of the most popular uh, Slovenian writers. Uh, but yeah, but as you probably understand right now, I'm more into the news of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Yes. And yeah, so unfortunately, less literature for me nowadays. Uh, but yeah. Just, that's how it is. Yeah, I, that's totally understandable. Um, do you know if those books are available in, in English translations or are they? They should be. Yes, they are. Uh, yep. Oh, OK, great. So Kaylee will uh, have a look for them and and share links to where you can purchase them in the um, in the chat. So before we hear you read from Invisible, is it OK if I share your biography with everybody? Sure, go ahead. Ivan Baidak is a Ukrainian author whose three novels and two short story collections have been published to great acclaim. His debut novel, Personally Me, Personally For You, became a national bestseller in Ukraine, and his second novel, A Man With My Name, received many positive reviews. His two short story collections, Role Plays and The Shadows of Our Dates, topped bookstore bestseller lists. In 2020, his novel, Invisible, was recognized as one of the best 2020 by Penn Ukraine and there was a stage play and photo exhibit based on the novel. It has been translated into Polish, Italian, and English. Ivan was resident at the Camargo Foundation in Cassis, France, where he worked on a screenplay for Invisible and was also hosted, as he just mentioned, by the Slovenian Writers Association in Bled, Slovenia. Ivan has lived all over the world, including Poland, Austria, Mexico, and the United States, where he studied at City College of San Francisco and he is currently in Toronto. Yvonne, welcome again. Thank you, thank you, Alison. Uh, cool, that's, that's a nice biography. <laughs> so you learned me quite good. <laughs> I do just a little bit of research um, yeah, perfect. Before, before I sit down to talk. Um, I'm thrilled and excited uh, to hear you read from Invisible today. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'll take one of the passages. Um, so I do believe I'm going to uh, read their uh, passage from Adam. Uh, Adam is one of their uh, main characters of Invisible. And basically, Adam um, has Tourette syndrome, uh, like I do. Uh, so I do believe it's going to be quite uh, honest uh, part, uh, part of the book. 
Uh, I've got used to living with ticks, um, but I will hardly ever get used to its surprising new forms, just like I will never make peace with the fact that I have to live through this. I have long been trying to understand my feelings, but I could never put my finger on the format of our relationship. I'm in constant struggle with my body. Each of its new tricks catches me unawares. My body can make me cough, jerk my neck, blink, raise my hands, stretch my legs, shout out run, random sounds. It looks like some kind of a role play uh, for domination, but I often get tired of the battle, which feels more like a game of anti-chess. I might find myself buttoning my shirt up and down dozens of times, winding my watch, playing with my phone, opening and closing popular apps as if performing some ritual. I don't always tie my uh, shoes because I get angry uh, when I can't align my eyelids. I have to be extra careful when cooking. There's always uh, a risk I might burn myself. I steer clear of amusement parks uh, because it might have a sad ending. I'm afraid of having sex too, since I'm not uh, sure I'll be able to control the moment of orgasm. That's very distressing. Sometimes I want to hurt myself to punish this body of mine that gets so tired of itself that it keeps aching and causing muscle cramps. If you don't sleep well, your tick is sure to exhaust you in the morning. If you let yourself drink more coffee or alcohol than usual, it will destroy you. Even if I won a million dollars in the lottery, the joy I'd feel would only make my tick worse. That's why I avoid all kinds of emotional triggers. I don't read bad news. I don't watch dramas. I protect myself from intense emotions. It's quite uncomfortable. A life like this is not fun. I wish I could make a bargain with Stuart syndrome or at least take a brief vacation from it. Okay, so that was uh, the Adam passage. Uh, Allison, you here? Yes, yeah, sorry. I thought you were. I uh, thought you were going on to read something else. I'm okay, sorry. Uh, ju just up to you. I can. Uh, I can also move to some other part, or we can. <clears throat> I am. I am happy to do whatever. We can talk about the book. We can hear more from the book. Whatever. Whatever. Okay, well, <clears throat> probably let's talk, and I'm going to read uh, some other passages uh, in the end. Oh, okay. All right. That's great. I, what what struck me in reading the book and in looking at your other novels and short stories that you've written, I, I and I apologize, I, it'll be difficult for me to separate the personal, my son who has a facial difference, who's sitting up in the corner there, um, it, it is, a, is a big part of uh, a lot of the questions I've got today. But what struck me more than anything in thinking about Invisible in relation to all of your books was as a writer with Tourette syndrome, why was this your third novel, do you think, and not your first? Well, so it's a very good, um, good question. And, and yeah, greetings to Duncan. So I was very happy to, to meet him uh, as he went in Toronto. Um, so you see, uh, I always try to, to say that if I uh, wrote this um, novel like a couple of years ago, it would probably be a very different story. So it's, mm -hmm. it would be a story uh, full of, I don't know, misery, uh, like depression, I don't know, anger, uh, stuff like that. So I do believe I wasn't still uh, ready uh, to cope with my tics, to cope with Tourette's, uh, with the fact that I, I, I'm actually living this Tourette's syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, I really believe it, it would be like my last book and I would uh, write this book probably, I you know, when I am older um, because I, I wouldn't, Probably, I thought I wouldn't be brave enough, uh, you know, to go out into the public saying about Tourette syndrome and mm -hmm. like not not only about Tourette syndrome itself because it's visible and most people who meet me is easy not as it, but it's more about like life and what what, what life with um, some visible um, disorder might look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so therefore, you know, I, I always uh, put this book aside, like, um, I actually, I, I have five books published in Ukraine right now, and I mean, it's like uh, classic fiction, and I like to call myself, you know, so I'm very young, but I, I like to call myself, you know, this old school writer who writes this uh, live fiction, um, and Invisible uh, wasn't like um, a book I was writing for, you know, my literature goals or um, mm -hmm. like you know like proving to the world that i am a good writer it was basically a message to society 
about uh, invisible people. So I normally put invisible a bit aside from, from other books. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it happens that um, at some point of my life, I realize, okay, that, that's enough. <laughs> um, I have... I, I have this uh, like takes for, for purely all my life. And at some mm -hmm. point of my life, I realized I'm not going to get rid of that. So if you cannot like change it, you, you need to learn how to live with that. Um, yeah. and, so, addre and address the social absolutely. implications of that. Yeah. And uh, when I finally, uh, you know, um, took over um the Tourette syndrome when I uh, I believe I won this battle right between me and Tourette syndrome mm -hmm. uh when I became quite calm about this um I felt it's it's time to write it's time to say the world about like the experience of uh, of people who live with uh like facial differences like some some disabilities mm -hmm and um to tell the world what it is um you know to address all those people who hide who are not um uh i, I mean who, who are trying to to hide from society and basically from mm -hmm. themselves that uh, hey guys you still have your life you uh, deserve your life and full of uh, great uh, things and you can make all your dreams come true and there there's no limit in your life yeah. despite yeah. any type of, of you know issues you might you might have or you think you have mm -hmm. so yep that's that's what just the perfect time to write it yeah there are a lot of parallels um in the book um and you talk about the the outside and and affecting trying to affect trying to make an impact on the, not just the audience the reader of the book but people out there and people's reactions um about face uh, international's campaign this year is about equity and equality in the workplace and i was really moved there's in the the one uh conversation that adam is having um with i think anna where they're talking about um about facial differences and and you know these invisible differences um, compared to cancer, compared to a lot of um, conditions that are getting all kinds of help, I think as Anna said it, I'm not sure if Anna or Adam said it, um, and that people with visible differences have been left out of the system. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that, you know, vitiligo and hemangioma and Tourette and, and um, alopecia have been left out of the conversation, the equity and, and equality conversation? Uh, well, I do believe it's changing right now still. Uh, so I mean, all those, um, all those questions are raised and like, uh, like me personally, I'm more into, of course, Tourette's uh, syndrome. So I, I made a, like a lot of investigations and it's still the topic which is uh, raised quite often, obviously not, um, you know not like as you mentioned like you know the common conditions mm, yeah. um you know like w when we talk about like um for example um these conditions and cancer uh probably because um I'm, i mean it, it might seem it's not that serious obviously you cannot die from that right you can mm. you can you cannot die from vitiligo you cannot die from alopecia and yeah, in, in most cases, you cannot die from Tourette syndrome unless uh, Tourette syndrome makes some consequence, right? Uh, right for me, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. for, for me, for example, I, I got into uh, the car accident twice, and it was obviously due to Tourette syndrome. And I actually, mm -hmm. I felt the moment when I lose control over myself, and I was like starting ticking, and the next uh, moment, I'm into the next car um yeah it, it wow, wasn't yeah. a bad like accident but but still uh, i realized it wouldn't happen if i didn't have Tourette syndrome mm -hmm. um uh, yeah so i do believe that that's probably uh, is the main uh, reason <laughs> uh yeah. so it's not little like this is those old diseases it's more about uh like just the way you you look uh, and also yeah. i believe you know i talk with a lot of psychologists and i talked uh with a lot of uh, people with um this uh, like uh, facial differences um so first of all they do share like um common emotions even though they have different stories um uh, and um the reason is also that people decide to hide uh that their like choice um you know to to be somewhere um invisible mm -hmm. so maybe that's also one, one of the reasons 
Uh, but again, but, but I see trends that it's changing and, you know, uh, the world, uh, like in most parts of the world, of course, uh, I mean, it's becoming more tolerant and uh, we are becoming like, uh, uh, people becoming more tolerant. So I do believe all those people uh, with, you know, different uh, conditions uh, will really deserve, uh, you know, so will we'll really get support mm-hmm. and, you know, they're, uh, they're going to be treated the way uh, they should be. Yeah, you're at the at the heart of the novel are these four people, Marta, Anna, Eva, and Adam, and friendship. They're bonded not just by their differences, but by their sense of humor. I I feel like each one of them has a, a like quirky sense of humor, um, <laughs> and they're they're attracted to each other. I think because of. Uh, not just their their um, su- you know mutual support group and, and that they're bonded because of that. How have you experienced friendships in your life? Have you? I I sort of feel like just in again and speaking from personal experience that that feeling like Anna, Marta, Eva, and Adam are going to be bonded for a very long time because of either a fear of not having friends or a fear of having to work too hard to to make friends how has your experience been with support groups and friendships and um is this where is this where a good question like um so i didn't have any issues uh when i was a child correct mm-hmm. because uh I was born in a particular like small town. There were like seven thousand people. So basically, at some point of their lives, they, everyone everyone knew me. So everyone yeah. probably knew that you know that weird guy who is blinking or stuff like that. <laughs> right. I, I'm joking. Yeah. So may, maybe they all have this, as you say, quirky sense of humor because it's probably my sense of humor. You know, full of irony, <laughs> self irony. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and I didn't. I didn't feel any kind of you know problems issues when I was a child and probably you know uh, children in most cases uh, they uh, they were kind-hearted and they mm-hmm. don't yet learn all those tragedizes uh, I know they don't notice all those differences they just you know they, they're just friends <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's easy to get friends when you're a child and by the way like I, I got a really interesting idea um like recently, uh, one of the re- readers you know, of Invisible told me, "Hey, why don't you write Invisible for children?" Um, it's actually, yeah. So uh, this is like a, an adult or mm-hmm. a young adult. I wouldn't call it young adult. It's like uh, it's recommended probably for young adult. But um, that's a good idea to write Invisible for mm-hmm. you know for for like kids who are like in between six and ten um, years old. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm thinking of that. Yeah. So my issue started uh, when you know when I became a teenager and I was surrounded by teenagers. It's basically the time when um, your personality grows and develops yeah. and and, you know others as well and you know there are always certain groups who, uh, I mean of um, sometimes they, they try to find someone weak uh, you know and try um, yeah um, so I do believe it started when I was a teenager uh, but luckily due to like my personal my personality I'm quite open-minded and uh, you know uh, I'm really uh, hard to offend uh, mm-hmm. and I do believe I'm a great conflict solver um, so so basically yeah for first yeah, I, I was starting like journalist communications so I do believe I, I'm quite a good diplomat therefore mm-hmm. I, I didn't have a lot of issues right yeah. um, in my life um, uh, but but of course you face though, right? Uh, I mean, you cannot uh, find context with, with every person. And mm-hmm. uh, obviously there were people who didn't like me. Um, someone said it like uh, openly. Someone was just behind my, uh, my, my, my back. But um, probably those scenarios, those episodes you read in Invisible, they're absolutely true. I mean, they, they yeah, happen yeah. To, to all those people. And if you remember... Um, w- when Anna was trying to to apply uh, for a job, uh, no, it, it it was Eva actually. Um, she no, it, it was Anna. Sorry, I I, I mess up my my, my characters. Yeah, Anna's the one with alopecia, yeah. and she she works for yeah, uh, yeah. 
television yeah yeah so so obviously it was uh, it was hard for her because i mean first of all she lost her confidence and she she grew with some with some conflicts right now mm-hmm. and uh, there was also a real story when her uh, the girl i was interviewing the girl with himangioma and you know invisible is also described when she was trying to apply for uh, for the job um, she was refused and she was refused only because of her looks and right. y- yeah you can imagine when you you know come over the interview and there are like people who are interviewing you and everything they talk about is is your like difference which has nothing to do with your to your professional skills mm-hmm. um, so it's quite hard and this girl actually told me that when she was applying for this job uh, she used uh, she used two different type of CVs one with uh, with a photo and another without a photo and the one with uh, with a photo didn't get any responses uh, the one mm-hmm. um, without uh, the photo got like a lot of you know positive feedbacks so yeah that's that's kind of life so in terms of friendship um again uh i i didn't have like personally any problems making friends but but of course uh there were a lot of um, situations not really pleasant for me when i mean where people just disliked me uh, Mm -hmm. because of of tourists like basically because of the fact uh i I couldn't control and um yeah but i kind of (laughs) learned myself where it were easy that uh, you cannot be friends with anyone and um, yeah you know I, just I, find your people that's that's it yeah i wonder i wonder how you describe yourself as a as a diplomat and a conflict resolver i wonder how much of that is because you're constantly thinking about potential conflict and you know leaving the house or going out to work or going on public transit that you're you're thinking constantly about something happening and in your mind you're resolving it before it even happens oh cool. yes yeah, that's a very yeah. good question Allison yeah. uh I mean you you're experienced uh, so uh, you know what I feel yeah uh well I, I, I don't I I'm just well uh, yeah I, I mean from the site uh yes yeah uh, you're exactly right. Um, I mean, I learned myself to be like that. I yeah. educated myself. So um, I had all the questions, uh, all the answers to all possible before questions. Yeah, yeah. Before they actually, you know, um, happened to, to be with me. So I knew mm-hmm. what, I, what I have to say. I knew, I knew like what people react. I, you know, I can categorize like different people. Like, you know, some of yeah. them are, might be uh, just curious and trying to help someone um, just gonna directly I don't know harass you yeah. um, some of them are I don't know just gonna ignore you sometimes for example like uh, you getting into, into the train compartment and there are some people who, who just look at you where we are trying to escape so I kind of learned um, how, how to deal with all those uh, types yeah. of people like for example right now uh, like when talking to the foreigner uh, I know all the answers to possible questions about the war in Ukraine. So Mm -hmm. uh, I I also, I was also educating myself, you know, but, you know, but this frequently asked questions. So I also have this frequently asked questions regarding tourists, regarding what is me. Um, So I was quite prepared to like any possible situation which might uh, happen. Yeah, no, and I'm sure that's, that's happening a lot. I mixed up. I said Marta was the character with Alice. Yeah. She's the character with the hemangioma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Marta is also the only character born with a difference, and Adam, Anna, and Eva acquire their differences. When you and I know a lot of this is is based on personal experience and and real life, and you may have not simply chosen the the conditions or the people that you wanted to present in the novel. But I wanted to talk about that, the difference between acquired um, differences and disabilities and, um, you know, Marta's hemangioma and born with. Was that a, um, a narrative decision to have have those four or was it just happenstance? Those just happen well, to be the people you. Yeah, 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 again, like. Uh those were the people I knew and those were the people who were um, the closest to me and those were the people who basically uh, shared their stories. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, because uh, 
so regarding the difference of um, like a condition you are born with or a condition you, you acquired, uh, well, it, it's only a difference uh, when you need to accept it, right? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, if you require, uh, if you acquire uh, some condition, obviously it's harder because you know you you can compare um, your previous life with mm -hmm. you know well when you're born with some condition you you, you just basically have no choice yeah. right but yeah. uh, if you face with uh, alopecia so uh, obviously it's hard mm -hmm. it's it's extremely hard because you know something changing and you see uh, this change is not for good and yeah. um, you see it's gonna um, make you a lot of issues like both like medical and, and, and social mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's way harder and uh, first of all you're trying to, to resolve this issue and only uh, with the time uh, you can you, you can basically you know either accept yourself or, or I don't know basically yeah. better accept yourself no no other option yeah. as i like to say and um with the born one you basically you develop with it uh, yeah. as a personality so it's like a part of your identity mm -hmm. and you you cannot i mean there's nothing you could do right um right yeah uh, like in my case with turrets it, it was quite uh, i don't know uh, like i was diagnosed to it to it when i was 12 um and i have a feeling like uh, i've been always with that because i don't yeah. remember myself when i was like yeah five six years old so yeah yeah and it's interesting you talked about becoming a teenager and alopecia vitiligo and tourette come mm -hmm. on at the same time uh you know you're entering uh this like dreamy social world where you're going to have more independence where you're going to have more friends where you're going to be able to go out and go bowling and and do all of these things that the characters in the book talk about forcing themselves to do right like getting out of the house and and learning a new hobby as the the group facilitator recommended um and it's funny because i was thinking personally i you know my social anxiety my tendency is when social events happen i say no that's like my natural response and so i wanted to talk to you about how how having tourette syndrome affected or played with your natural personality if you describe yourself if you would describe yourself as an extrovert or an introvert and how how they exist together hmm. good question again um uh i, I do believe i'm expert and introvert <laughs> all together <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, it just depends what period of life i'm having uh yeah as i said like before before i got 26 and before i decided you know to do something with tourists um it was probably the topic I was uh, broadening in my uh, in my brain all the time. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, if you talk with me when I was like 25, it was a man uh, who was um, really limited um, by, by the Tourette syndrome, who was obviously uh, avoiding any type of socializing. Um, I mean, I, I had those small groups of people I, I enjoyed with, but but obviously it was hard for me. Like I, I was going, like for example, being a student, like most of students are afraid of the exams of like studying for the exam. Yeah, yeah. I realized I have to deal with the turrets uh, as well because I realized it, it, it can block me. Obviously, right. I yeah, I would be nervous. And I mean, I wouldn't even control myself to, to answer. And basically, same like meeting new people, going for dates, like, you know, like meeting some, some, some girl, you realize, okay, um, is she even going to be interested if she's not? Yeah. This is my, my uh, Tourette syndrome. Like, it's probably going to be like, no, because uh, what person having a choice would choose um, a person with you, you know some some disorder and there might be some questions about like um if you're okay if you're like yeah you know, man mentally healthy and yeah yeah I, I mean never tourist syndrome is uh, neurological so it has nothing to do with like mental health uh nor with you know the health in general it's just a neurologic stuff um and the same like me like going out to uh, every new 
you know, group of people is again like going out to a stage when all the eyes are just focused on you because you are the one who uh, gets more most attention because obviously yeah. you, you notice and it, it's psychologically proved that you um, that, that people tend to notice something which looks differently right yeah. so there is nothing we can do with our um, uh, you know uh, nature um, but all, all we can do is just a choice how we can react uh, to yeah. like to people um, with, with, with some differences but yeah but when again when I started to accept in myself my Tourette syndrome uh, got like easier so we, it, it's not that severe yeah. anymore first of all so you wouldn't notice that a lot yeah. uh, but secondly I started I, I just didn't care like right it's just the way i am like you got to a point where you're just like yeah this is who i am this is who i am exactly yeah Yeah. that's uh i I mean there's a the camaraderie among the the four friends is is kind of that right they all at the end when the at well i won't talk about that a lot but they all at some point in the novel just kind of go you know what I am who I am. This is, this is what I, this is what I am. And that's kind of a a universal truth, right? That everybody Mm -hmm. in some form has flaws they're afraid to share. And that's what I loved about Invisible. It's not just a book for people who have differences. It's not just a book for people who have, you know, who have um, disabilities and, and visible, visible conditions. There's a line uh, in the book, Anna says, a body is not a person, which to me was an incredible line that to some degree, we all have to face that we are not how we present on the outside, right? And that we are not a a kind of culmination of our, our flaws or negative experiences, What do you hope more than anything Invisible tells the world? Um, Alison, uh, I mean, you you got this very right point. It's it's not only about like the invisible people, it's basically about everyone. And I I really hope that more people read this book because I believe everyone... um, at some point of their lives, they uh, struggle with something about themselves. It's not only about, you know, the appearance. It's also about, like, you know, our decisions, choices we make, like, about our lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact is, like, people mostly are not satisfied with their lives. And, I mean, they get angry. Uh, they might, you know, in one of my videos, I say that, like, uh, we always find, like, uh, lots of reasons to hate ourselves instead of love ourselves. And, mm-hmm. um, because curious but when i was interviewing like all those people and there were like 10 15 20 just let me say up to 20 interviews and there were different people right mm-hmm. um so there were people like for example there was another girl uh, from you know, with hemangioma and she had like uh, 30 uh, facial uh, surgeries and uh, i mean it's very visible and you know mm-hmm. the story she's speaking and and like an hour later you interview another person um who kind of looks uh, normal, let me say this word very carefully. And, uh, and, and what, what, I, what I realized, like there, there are two people, right? And when, when, you see, when you see them from medical perspective, as one girl has, uh, I don't know, quite visible and clear medical um, issues, mm-hmm. another one doesn't. And actually it turned out that the, the other girl was just, D- didn't like uh, the size of her ears right, right. Um, so I mean from medical perspective uh, there's a very big difference between them but yeah. from an emotional side they share the same experience I mean they care about um, the way they look the same they struggle absolutely the same mm-hmm. and you know and sometimes I even blame myself uh, that I allow myself to be you know skeptical about uh, about one person over over another one like saying hey you don't have issues i just talked with with another person who really has but that's what i realized everyone has their own struggle we not always see and rather than you know um 
try trying to hurt the person again we we need to try uh find the ways to help them mm -hmm. so therefore there's also a question of friendship uh, because we all search for support and we all need you know someone we can uh we can talk to we can cry mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we can you know get the, we can hear those uh words um of support we we, we need to hear so mm -hmm. that's how it is that's great. Um, I would love to hear uh, another couple of minutes of you reading if you'd like to share. And in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the in the chat and uh, and we'll talk about it after Yvonne finishes this this particular reading. OK, but if you don't mind waiting for one minute, uh, because there is a very specific text um, I actually want to uh, want to read and I'm not sure which page it is on. So That's just, fine. That's totally fine. Um, also, Alison, if you want to read any of your <laughs> of chapters of Invisible, it's also going to be nice. I really like your voice. It's, I don't. I, I'm. I'm happy to do. I'm cool. happy to do anything. But I honestly, it's it's your it's your book. Okay. Your, okay. I okay. It's it's great to hear your voice. Okay. Give me just a moment. Um, there's a very uh, very nice uh, part. I I like. Do you know what section it is? Um, Remember what was happening? Not really. Okay. But but I'm, I'm just worried. because I I just reread it, so I might mm -hmm. be able to find it. Okay. Um. That's about their uh, those episodes uh, at their uh, train compartment. There was um, I don't believe Anna's uh, episode. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm probably gonna gonna go with another one because uh, I can't find it, but it's so it's gonna be also on us, um, and that's gonna be uh, the episode um, which. Uh, uh, which I already described when a girl uh, was trying, you know, to apply for uh, uh, for for work, and mm. it's pretty much very very shocking when you know with the experience she she and she faced with. Yeah. Um, the second story destroyed my previous attitude. By the way, more than a decade passed between the two of them. Over those years, I faced insults of all sorts, misunderstandings, and rejections. I was annoyed by unwanted sympathy, uh, but then my deepest fear came true. I bumped up against my first limitations. I had blocked out the thought that my disfigurement uh, might somehow prevent me from living my life uh, to the fullest. I imagined it bright and eventful, but unfortunately, I was forced to adapt. I came from a small town. Uh, so small that all its residents know each other. And in the rare case that one of them is not familiar with another, uh, this accident is quickly fixed. My point is that everyone in town knew about my hemangioma, even if they um, had never seen me in person and they um, didn't care. But then I left home for college and established university, intelligent young people, I never experienced prejudice. Strangers in the street uh, pestered me sometimes, but I maintained my attitude and sharpened my sense of irony. Once I graduated from the university, I started to look for a job, and it was my entry into adulthood that opened up society's playbook to me. None of the 30 companies I applied to invite me uh, an interview. It was weird. The theory of probability was apparently broken. I suspected the reason, but uh, stubbornly refused to accept the reality. I hated to think that my hemangioma might turn out to be an obstacle for me. Here I was, an ambitious girl monitoring job search websites all day long, keeping a file with the names of companies where she applied, hunting down new opportunities and devising new strategies. The most obvious strategy turned out to be the most effective one. The following week, I mailed resumes, resumes without my photo. And uh, lo and behold, half of the companies got back to me. 
Several of them even invited me to an interview. If I had had more free time, I would have shot a documentary video with a spy, uh, with a spy camera. I would have recorded the employer's reactions when they saw me. It was a shame that professional ethics uh, didn't allow them to speak their minds. Every interview fo followed a sad routine. They asked me the typical questions, ignoring my uh, disfigurement, even though I was sure it was the only thing that occupied their minds. Do you enjoy working as a part of the team? What kind of professional literature do you read? Where do you see yourself in a year? Please describe your greatest success. I really doze off while they uh, rush thought as their questioners. Uh, why did they do it? Why not just ask me straight? What's wrong with you? They now called me back. Some companies emailed me uh, a formal rejection letter at best, but it tormented me the most because I was struggling to understand whether they had rejected me due to my disfigurement or if it was my professional skills that proved a poor fit for them. The next two interviews provided exhaustive answers to my questions. They took place as an advertising agency uh, where I applied for the position of public relations manager. The office administrator created me with uh, caution, double checking if I had really come for a job interview. I nodded. She gave me a quick tour around the office. Chaos was the only thing that caught my attention. And she ushered me a cramped glass, uh, glass walled room in the corner and offering a glass of water asked me to wait. Soon the director, as the head of the marketing department and another prospective colleague, uh, colleague of mine, entered the room uh, one by one. They couldn't hide their surprise. Quickly pulling themselves together, uh, so they took their places in front of me and introduced themselves. That time I took a different tack. I explained my situation before any of them had a chance to ask me anything. They pretended to understand me and the director even assured me that it wouldn't impact the professional assessment. Oh God, what happened to you? The HR manager cried out. She had just entered the room. I had to explain my situation once again. Shall we close the window so it doesn't get worse? She clearly didn't understand me. Are you planning to hire her? She said, turning to the director. Seriously. She referred to me in the third person as if I weren't there. The room fell quiet. As the men looked at one another, the HR manager obviously had nothing to add. Let's stop the interview, I said. I don't want to waste your time. The director shook his head and tried to apologize for his employee. But she, um, but she will be a PR manager. She'll have to organize events and talk to the media, as the woman said, ranting on. We'll consider that, the director said, trying to handle the situation. We can stop now, I repeated. But the woman cut herself short of the time. The job interview continued. They thanked me for coming. I thanked them for the water. They never followed up. At most interviews, I was never asked about my disfigurement, but I found it hard to answer job-related questions with that elephant in the room. The feeling were always there, amazement, confusion, hostility. The question was if the interview, interviewers were polite enough to hold back their comments. At yet another interview, the manager made careful inquiries about my hemangioma. Is it temporarily? Will you have uh, undergo treatment? Then he asked me about my work experience and moved on to talk about his company only to pause and ask, are you sure that can be fixed? Sorry, he said and carried on talking. Up to a point, it was a pleasant interview with not so pleasant conclusions. As the manager seemed to treat my situation with understanding, but I knew I wouldn't get a job. What is it all about anyway? The manager asked suddenly pulling me out of my reverie. The emotions um, that fill him up during our conversation are finally spilled over. What's wrong with you? Can you tell me, please? I just can't hire you, no. You'd walk around the office like that and I would have no clue what it's all about. Um, do you remember my initial attitude, the attitude of denial? Well, at that moment, it crumbled. There is always a trigger capable of destroying all your beliefs in an instant. There are always new challenges you are not ready for, new situations you are not yet immune to. After the series of job interviews, I realized that my hemangioma was a genuine problem, no matter how hard I tried to escape it. There was my problem, there was my world, there was me, and the three of us had to coexist. The state of uh, denial gradually gave me a state of understanding, a system for accepting myself and my new reality. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I did mix up the names. 
And okay, yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah, it's like, what? Um, I, I love that. I love. I I not only loved that moment in in the interview and with her self realization, but I liked that every character at some point in the book comes to a moment where, as you said, as you said earlier, they come to a moment where they say, okay, like forget what I'm fighting a losing battle, kind of like I exactly. I can hide inside. I can avoid doing all of this stuff and nothing's going to like, I'm never going to affect what, how other people um, see me or how other people behave, um, which you, you talked about um, in with the previous question that I asked you. Mm -hmm. um, Kaylee, do we have any questions from people? We do. We have a question from Diane. Um, and Diane, sorry, I'm scrolling up. <laughs> um, Diane sa says or asks, um, Yvonne, you said you to, you try to avoid bad news to keep Tourette syndrome um, your Tourette syndrome under control. Has that changed with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and how has this influenced your work? Um, thank you, Diane. Uh, yeah, ni nice to see you here, and I'm looking forward to to meeting you in Edmonton really soon. Uh, regarding uh, obviously, it'll it change everything. So obviously, mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm all into the news, and uh, obviously I don't avoid them. And uh, you see, before before the war, my my life was was, was quite nice. It was like uh, having a job, um, you know, uh, having some sports, um, reading, uh, writing, um, meeting friends, uh, spending time with my family. So it it, it was a well and cozy routine right um but also the war changed everything and it's like like before the war i rarely checked some news um you know it was only like some sports news but but nothing more unless something big happens and i see uh, i notice it on facebook because everyone is talking about it and then i read the news but nowadays like for for almost eight months i am i'm checking the news like um all the time so I mean, I'm on my phone probably like nine or ten year, ten hours a day, which is not good. So obviously, my my tea got worse as we were beginning of the war, and um, and, and now I I'm I'm kind of accustomed. You know, it's sad to say this, mm -hmm. but yeah. um, me and Ukrainians were kind of accustomed to that uh, we hear bad news all the time, right? First, it's shocking. I mean, when, when you see, like, for example, like two days ago, Russians, I mean, uh, were shelling uh, this, the colony of cars of civilians and they killed more than 30 people. And you cannot imagine, like, how, how it's happening. So you lose yourself for a day or two. And yeah, obviously, my, my take is getting worse, but um, I cannot avoid, avoid, you know, the news. So uh, I'm just living with it like it is. And uh, yeah, yeah I, w I was thinking about that the other day when when they found uh, the graves and I'm, I'm so sorry yeah. um, the that the media people, you know, people in Canada, people outside of Ukraine, like you say, get used to it. Right. So the the shocking stories coming out like you almost have to read and and force yourself to read all mm -hmm. the time as a reminder that that this is happening and it's not happening to us it's happening to another country but you ha we have to force ourselves to read so that we we know and it's it's not continuing to happen in the background kind of exactly i mean yeah Kaylee, are there any other questions? Sorry. Yeah. Too many buttons to unmute. Uh, we don't. <laughs> we don't as of yet. But if anyone has any, please feel free to drop them in the chat or direct message me, um, and we can ask before our time is up. Okay. I wanted to ask you, and I and I know the challenges of of what's happening in Ukraine are interfering with your reading, but I wanted to ask you, and I love absolutely love the idea of Invisible as a children's book. Um, when Duncan was younger, and and when other uh, kids I know were younger, it was a big conversation that there just were no children's books um, uh, with kids that you know are just living with their differences and existing in a classroom and existing in the world um so i love that if that is your next literary project i'm a big fan but are you 
working on anything else? Are you thinking about, have ideas been? Well, um, uh, right now, <laughs> the only stuff I'm writing those were I just basically daily notes of the war. Um, I, I'm not sure they're going to be, uh, you know, published. Uh, it's, it's more just for myself, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of calm me down, right? And uh, to have it... Uh, to have it in in my memory and yeah but again I, i'm not sure whether it's going to be a book or, or not one day like mm -hmm. um we will see it's just, just something to um to keep myself busy and, and to write as well you know writing is a therapy uh, but w when we're talking about like i i am always full of ideas like um mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example in the summer uh, i was very lucky to have a week off and I literally just was doing nothing by, by literature and I was planning my uh, my next novels and I do believe there are up to 10 stories I want to uh, I want to say I want to write about and mm -hmm. those are all you know just uh, short ideas like synopsis about like the idea about the topic about there's a mood um, but but they are definitely right now growing in my head and mm -hmm. the one which is probably uh, grows faster is going to be my my next book but when it's going to happen and when i'm gonna write yeah. it so yeah i, I will i really dream of this you know uh, so that you know the war ends and everyone gets back to normal and everyone gets back to their normal occupation and you know uh, writers will write uh, about mm -hmm. life from 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 beautiful beautiful perspective that's um that's what what, what i'm trying to do mm -hmm. uh, and yeah and same uh, about invisible <laughs> for for the kids uh, i understand it, it's very important uh, topic and basically this book invisible um I mean, in Ukraine, they speak right now of including um, this book to school programs. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, so so adult, like teenagers, you know, the older grades uh, actually uh, read it uh, when mm -hmm. they are still in school. And uh, I do believe it's it's nice initiative. Yeah, but for example, as for as for the book for kids, uh, I'm I'm still adult writer, and I'll yeah. have to read lots of uh, children's book and um, to get before that yeah feeling for it, yeah yes before before I learn and just ha have to have to write for kids. But yes, yeah, that's one of idea as well. Yeah. Um, so we are going to raffle off a copy of Invisible. Quernica has um, uh, generously donated two copies. We're going to raffle off one now, and we are going to raffle off another one to anyone who is uh, watching this video or joining us here today. Um, if you share anything about uh, upcoming events, uh, Yvonne has a ton of upcoming events. You're going to Edmonton when? Oh, well, there's going to be Calgary first uh, oh, okay. on the 6th, um, 6th of October. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be in Calgary and there it follows with two events in Edmonton on 13th and 20th. Nice. Yes. Yeah. So share any of Yvonne's upcoming events and tag Junction Reads and we're going to enter you into a raffle for the second copy um, of Invisible. Uh, but right now, Kaylee, we're going to give one away. All right. I use this little tin year round, but every time it comes to be fall, I'm like, it's finally the right color. It's right. finally <laughs> the right time to use my my little fall hedgehog tin. Oh, so it's a color. Cool. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. The winner for today is Diane Bratchuk. Brassuk? Brassuk? It's Brassuk. Brassic, Brassic, Diane. I'm myself, it's a Ukrainian name. Nice Ukrainian name. I'm excited. You're uh, Diane's in Edmonton. She has uh, brought literature to Junction Reads before, um, which is uh, very exciting um, to have you guys meet. I'm I'm thrilled. Yeah, we'll um, meet in person. A lot of Ukrainian people in Edmonton, so Ivan's Ivan's social calendar is going to be very busy. Well, <laughs> yeah. That's good. Um, Diane, I, if you've already gotten a copy, you know um, from experience, you can send me uh, the name of someone else and uh, nominate them to get a copy yeah. uh, gifted from uh, Karenica. Okay. And, uh, and that's it. This was a pleasure. Yvonne, well, my... I'm, 
I, I really, I can't uh, thank you enough for joining us today. It was, uh, it was great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. My pleasure, Welcome. my honor to be with you. Yeah. And hope to meet again in Toronto one day as well. Yes. Yeah. Anytime you can send me an email. Thank cool. you everybody for joining us. Uh, we have a few weeks off. Um, we're going to be back here on October 30th for a Halloween themed event uh, with SM Friedman and her new novel, Blood Atonement. Uh, check out junctionreads.ca where you'll be able to find this video uh, in a little while so that you can share it with your friends. And that is all, Yvonne. Best of luck on the tour. Uh, I hope you're getting some sleep through uh, <laughs> the, the 10 hours on your phone and all of the reading that you're doing. Cool. Likewise. Thank you. Great. Have a good and one. Kaylee and Sarah, thank you so much uh, for all that you do for Junction Reads. Good night, everybody. <laughs>